get it? Text a message, I don't know the number. Flexing on these niggas, every bone and muscle. Steady taking shots, never hurting them. Even then, y'all don't worry nothing. And I like to give a shout out to my niggas with the game plan. And shout outs to my niggas with escape plans. Uh, 20 bands, rain dance. We can eat the rain check and we can make plans. Pockets loaded, rocket loaded, can't let's rock and roll this. Time to go, lock, stock, and two smoking barrels locked and loaded. Diamonds glowing, chop, climbing on them. We think I'm jumping up. Uh, my name is Anissa Israel, I'm 26, uh, I'm from Kenya, I was born in Kenya, um, but raised in London, so I now live and work in London. I, I actually feel more beautiful with my makeup on, so this will consist of a good 45 minutes, doing my eyebrows, um, putting on eyelashes, foundation, makeup. Um, if I haven't got braids in, that means I've got to spend another hour doing my hair, um, slicking it up, doing all my little edges and things like that. So it takes different forms depending on, I guess, like the time I have, um, how I feel in the morning and what I want to look like. My name is Andrea Jacob. I'm 21 years old. I go to New York University, but I grew up in Orange County, California, Irvine, California. All of my products, face products, have been given to me. Before these days, I was a Neutrogena pomegranate face wash, maybe some Lubiderm on the face, call it a day. I'm so OCD about my hair, so I can never tell if it's like actually something looks bad or if it's just me. I do think that everyone aspired to be the Alexis Wren Instagram model, you know, the Gigi Hadid, blonde hair, just fun loving quiet girls. I think I really wanted to look like Sarah Snyder, <laughs> which is funny. I wanted to be blonde with a really cute face, you know, have the straight hair. I wish I always had wanted to cut it short, but I knew that it wouldn't look good. To be honest, I never wanted to look like anyone else. I think I knew from a young age that I was me, and that was that. I remember I went through an obsession with Avril Lavigne. All my dolls were, were white with straight hair. The TV programs, um, it was very rare to see um, a black child um, or a black teenager. I would often compare myself to the women I was seeing on TV. I thought that by having straighter hair or by having bigger boobs or by looking like my white friends at school that I would be more beautiful. I was bullied in primary school and in secondary school and this kind of resulted in me then being a bully myself. In secondary school it was because I was different. I was like, I think I was one of like five or six black kids in like my whole year group. Um, and I just remember just being quite different and not fitting in with the girls um, and wanting so badly to like be a part of like this girl group. Um, and yeah, I remember going into the playground and just being like alone. And that was like, it's so weird, like thinking about it now because such a long time ago, but it's still, it still affects you um, because I've always kind of been a bit of a loner. I do my own thing and I like it that way. Now I do, but then it was causing me to, so the fact that I was different or just a bit of an outsider um, made people not want to hang out with me. So I'd be in the, in, in the playground kind of walking around by myself or sitting at the lunch table alone. And that was really, really tough as a kid, yeah. I wouldn't say that I was outwardly bullied for my blackness in Orange County as much as I was sneak dissed, you know? I was, um, I, it was subtle, it was underhanded. It was, oh, you're pretty for a black girl, 
you know? Oh, you kind of look like that one black girl who you, I do not look at all like, you know? Or is that your sister, the only other black girl at the school? Crazy things like that, um, that, you know, you can't get mad at. Before I went to NYU, everyone would always say, oh, she's black and she's a girl and that's how she got in, you know? It was my race and my gender that got me in because obviously affirmative action, that's what, that's what happens. And I believed that, I, I joked about it. I thought that too, I said it along with everyone else. That's how I understood myself, that all of my achievements or anything that, that my worth was, it stemmed from the negative stereotypes around my race and my gender. I look back now and I'm so grateful that my mom and my dad put me into um, Hendon School, which is where I went, because it was mixed and multicultural. There was a big black population at my school. And this is complete opposite to my primary school, which was Jewish, basically, and was populated by, you know, rich white kids. Going to Hendon School, it was like a whole new world. I was being taught how to be black. And I think that's when I realized what beauty was, was, was that being my skin color, wearing braids, wearing cane rows was actually pretty and was actually, people thought that was cool. Um, so I think that's the first time I realized that I could be beautiful. I don't think I felt it then, but I knew that I could be beautiful. The fashion, the slicking of the hair, um, do you know what I mean? Wearing trainers, like styling up your uniform, being unique and being cool at the same time, but also being black. I just had a transformation. I just realized my self-worth. I realized who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be. And I just focused on being the best version of my natural self. I uh, began wearing my hair curly all the time. I refused to straighten it. It's just been a lot of like little stepping stones. Um, but I think the biggest lesson that I took away, I think, was that I'm the most comfortable I've ever been in my own skin now is because I've just accepted that this is who I am. And I guess I stopped trying to please others around me, whether it's family or friends or friendship groups. I think now I just, I am myself for myself not fathers, yeah. I think each experience I had was necessary in me sitting here today and saying, I'm the most beautiful girl I want to be. Like, I am the most beautiful. And looking in the mirror, you know, at all times and going outside and just being me. And I'm beautiful no matter what anyone else says. With young black girls in particular, I think, more so now than ever, we're being accepted in society, um, being acknowledged in society. It's a pivotal point in society at the moment for black women. However, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that this shouldn't have to go away. I think it's important to acknowledge that what that being black isn't fashion, it's not just cool, being black is being black, period. Even if you look around in the office at the moment, there you can count the, you can count the black people in the office. Um, you can count the black people in the meetings I sit in, um, in the university I went to. Um, in the spaces I occupy, there's not enough of us. In New York, it is interesting how I see that a lot of people aspire to be black, for, for lack of a better way to put it to aspire to, to have that almost street credit, that culture credit, that cool credit. I think now that we see so many Kylie Jenner, Kim Kardashians, people who are really fetishizing and showcasing a very particular black experience, you know, on one hand, one might say that is very beneficial and black individuals in the rigid culture of Orange County would be able to find their their way to have a voice. But at the same time, that really brings the issue of the singular black identity, that there is only one type of black person and there's only one black voice and, and one black look. For girls who are living, you know, in a, in a bubble type community like Orange County, I really hope that they'll be able to find, you know, through Instagram, through social media, communities of people like them 
who are also experiencing the same thing. I, I'm still a part of those communities online and I think that was something, having Twitter and having, you know, Instagram meme accounts joking about, you know, the black woman, black woman's experience, that type of, you know, content really sh allowed me to get through it and say, you know, these people might be thinking one way, but I know there are people out there who are thinking differently. And I hope that these girls are able to, you know, find these communities and find their voices and really understand that their beauty is not defined by standards that are against them. What advice would I give to any young black girl would be to just like keep pushing and keep moving. Like, I would advise that you never set a standard too low for yourself. I would advise that if you want to be a if you want to be a lawyer, an entrepreneur, um, a CEO, it's possible. And I think we need more of that. This is the thing, and it's like society sets us up for failure in a sense. Not even not even in not even in the like physical sense, but in the mental sense. It makes you think because you see things on TV or you go into interview panels or you sit in meeting rooms or in an office where there isn't enough representation of yourself, you think you can't be that and that's not true. So I I would just say keep pushing, keep believing in yourself and there isn't really anything too small that can't be done.